Welcome to Season 4 of Home Value Stories. I'm Jamie Owen. This is a podcast that is designed to educate you about things related to real estate and real estate valuation. And I'm so happy that you joined me here today. I realized that Season 3 ended a little abruptly, and that's because life got a little crazy for my wife and myself. But there's a good chance that you had a crazy summer as well. Whether you had a crazy summer or a calm one, I hope that you're doing good and hanging in there. Speaking of crazy summers, the housing market is so hot that it seems almost unbelievable at times. One of the most common questions I get from people when I'm appraising their homes or visiting in offices is, do you think that we're in a housing bubble? So with that question in mind, I thought we'd start season four by tackling that question. When you think about a bubble, what comes to your mind? Bubbles bring to mind my childhood. Being a child in the 70s, my earliest memories of Bubbles is the Lawrence Welk Show, where Bubbles often floated around musicians and dancers on that show. Lawrence Welk was also known for his album, Bubbles in the Wine, which was released in 1956. Speaking of being a child in the 70s, another kind of bubble comes to mind. Bubble gum. And in particular, Bubblicious bubble gum. It was a brand of bubble gum that gave its competitor, Bubble Yum, a run for its money. It became known for its awesome flavors like cotton candy, paradise punch, sour cherry, lightning lemonade, and cocoa chip. According to Wikipedia, the lightning lemonade flavor was discontinued in 2000 and then resurrected in 2005 as LeBron James Lightning Lemonade. Apparently, LeBron James has brought back more than just basketball teams. Bubblicious was, and probably still is, known for its ability to make arguably the largest bubbles in the realm of bubblegum. Not all bubbles invoke feelings of happiness, though. For instance, an economic bubble. What is an economic bubble? If you search the internet, you'll find numerous definitions. But basically, the idea of an economic bubble is one that is characterized by a rapid increase in prices while the real or fundamental value is lower. The first recorded speculative bubble occurred in Holland from 1634 to 1637. At that time, speculation drove up the price of tulip bulbs to increasingly high levels. According to Investopedia, at the height of that bubble, the rarest tulip bubbles traded for as much as six times the average person's annual salary. It was caused by excessive greed and speculation. In more recent times, there was the dot-com bubble of the 90s. And then, of course, most of us remember the bubble that formed in the years leading up to 2008, the housing bubble, for which many of us still carry emotional scars and skepticism about anything that increases in value now. That bubble was also caused, to a large degree, by greed and speculation. But what about today's housing market? Do you think that we're in a bubble? To help answer that question, I reached out to my friend from New York, Jonathan Miller. He's a real estate appraiser who's been tracking the housing markets for decades. He shared some of his thoughts with me on whether he feels we are in a housing bubble. So when I think of the word housing, I usually think of Jonathan Miller Jonathan is an appraiser and owner of Miller Miller Samuel Incorporated. He's a market analyst and author of Jonathan Miller's Housing Notes, which offers a weekly narrative of the housing economy, focusing on what seems to be the most important, relevant, and to use your words, 
even the ridiculous. So welcome to the show, Jonathan. Oh, great to be here, Jamie. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. It's been a while since we've been able to to talk in person. I know. It's I know. A crazy year. So yeah, how's uh, how's things in the New York as far as your crazy market up there? Well, it it's funny. I, my office is based in Manhattan. We've been here uh, uh, either you know one office or another for the you know since the uh, nineteen ninety. 1986 is when we were founded. So we're uh, 35 years, basically. Uh, as of tomorrow, it'll be a 35th anniversary. And um, and so that's a long time, and you see lots of cycles. And what's fascinating is I've been through cycles like uh, 9-11, uh, Lehman, you know, um, uh, all kinds of Wall Street events, because Wall Street is uh, a big employer in our market. And now a uh, tech sector is sort of a close second. Um, and things have changed a lot. But what's fascinating is uh, New York in the pandemic was the center, sort of the global hotspot. Uh, I remember getting a, emails from appraisers a year and a half ago in the spring of 2020 saying, how are you holding up? You know, I'm in the middle of nowhere in a rural market and the pandemic will never hit me ever, you know, and then like three weeks later, they become the next hotspot. Um, but it was fascinating. Um, and what has really been interesting from a valuation standpoint is New York uh, was sort of the first. So there was a perception of safety problem, you know, that, that hey, New York isn't safe because everybody's crammed together, it's high density, right? And, and actually, it sort of led the way for this misinformation about the pandemic in, in, in the context of density. Density is a factor of you know, how close you live to other people, um, but it is not the sort of on-off switch. And the, the reason for that is looking at actual data. During the, the dark days of the lockdown in the spring of 2020, if you looked at COVID infection rates in New York City on the New York City website, the areas with the lowest infection was Manhattan. And the area with the highest infection was the outer reaches of Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island, which are largely suburb very suburban-like. So that whole like fleeing the city sort of narrative was based on this false assumption. And the real reason Manhattan anyway was uh, the uh, the outlier in the New York City metro area, meaning it was the weakest, is because the wealthy left. Something like forty percent of people in this in Manhattan moved out in March and April of 2020, and just like they were quick to move out, they took their time coming back in, and only until the vaccine adoption really took off in 2021, we're seeing a booming uh, market where we're seeing sales activity, you know, off the charts, even compared to the same period two years ago, which is probably the better way to look at it. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing. And it's being driven by low rates. Yeah. Yeah. That, I'm seeing that uh, in my market too. Well, across the country, you know, yeah, the surge, it really, it was counterintuitive, you know, the way that uh, the pandemic worked in many areas, like what you were describing. And even with housing, at least for me, it, it, I was assuming the worst was going to happen. I, you know, I have to admit, right. But exactly the opposite happened. Yeah. <laughs> right. It was. Uh, and, and I think the big reason for it is leading up to the pandemic prior to the pandemic, mortgage rates have been falling for a year and a half, two years, even though the economy was, for the most part, strong. Uh, and, you know, it was the Fed sort of managing against a recession with the trade war. Uh, that's my view anyway. And um, and then we have the pandemic. And so rates fall even further. And inventory, you know, is replaced organically. And, and it didn't have time. Uh, there was this monsoon of demand and people are over analyzing housing because they have nothing to do in their house. <laughs> and we have this like massive outpouring. And then, you know, appraisers are like, uh, this is more work than I can handle, you know, for a long time. 
uh, it's been an it was an incredible turn of events that's for sure and it really hasn't slowed down that that much no no you, the shortage that we see now it seems like it's it's shifted from you know now we're not in lockdown anymore for the most part but it seems like there's a shift in the housing where people are hesitant to put their home up for sale for one reason or another maybe it's because they can't find another home that's affordable yeah. anymore what are your thoughts yeah. on that yeah i think you know that's part of the sort of the lockup in uh inventory is that you aren't having people list their home for sale because even though their home might be worth a lot more but it's what i call money on paper you know it, it's it's like you know unless you're relocating to another region um you know you you know because the market's moving so quickly they really want to find something before they list and there isn't much i mean it's this odd situation uh that that i don't think can change i don't think it's going to change quickly with more new construction i i think this is a um you know and and it brings to this interesting point because there's been a lot of people sort of maybe not as much as I would have thought, but a lot of discussion about the word bubble, right? It's like, hey, it's a bubble. And the reason why I don't think it's a bubble, is, there's a couple of reasons. One is because inventory is not going, even if inventory, and we saw a modest uptick in inventory in the past month because sales have slowed down, uh, instead of being sort of markets being white hot, they're just brisk, right? And, um, you know, and bidding wars, instead of being 50% of all transactions, they're 35%. You know, it's still sort of insanity, but just, you know, relevant to where it was, it certainly slowed. And, um, and you know, a couple of reasons for that. One is that banks are about, their underwriting is about 20% tighter than it was before the housing bubble. That we're not going to have a banking crisis on the other side of this. That's number one. Um, number two is that uh, homeowners, because of the rapid price growth, have a tremendous amount of equity relative to the housing bubble. And so if there was a correction or, or prices drop, there's a good chance many would still have equity that they wouldn't have to sell, you know, when they're underwater, or, you know, short sale and things like that. And then I think the, um, the, the, the other, the other sort of aspect to this is that because inventory is tight, because rates are you know relatively low, um, and because the economy is relatively or you know is in pretty good shape, all things considered, uh, and there's billions in stimulus coming through the economy over the next couple of months, it's hard to you know, I think that the the way we're going to be describing when prices can't go up anymore uh, is uh, more of a plateauing or a cooling. Um, I actually called, I mean, I'm known in New York, I called for, I called the bubble in 07, which really wasn't hard because it really happened in 06, but New York had happened in 08 because Wall Street, our biggest employer was the primary cause of the housing bubble, you know, the financial engineering that went on so I could see it firsthand in our market. Um, the other point, too, is that when you look at household income and the percentage of debt that goes to of household income that goes to debt, uh, uh, mortgage, you know, which is mostly mortgage, um, the share of that is about 50 percent less than it was during the bubble. So we're not seeing people over leveraged and we're also not seeing people use their home like an ATM to the same degree as we saw during the bubble where they're using it to buy boats and second homes and all that. So I hate to be one of those people that say this time it's different. And I'm not saying, you know, we couldn't see prices level off and slip a little bit, but that's a far cry from seeing like a 30% correction um, is the way I is the way I look at it now anyway. Yeah, and I completely agree with you. It's it's just fundamentally a different time. Even buyers' attitudes uh, back, you know, in 06, 07, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I noticed that a lot of the buyers, 
you know, they just want to jump on that, that gravy train, knowing that things were just, they thought they would go up forever. Now, when people buy a home, it's like in the back of their mind, they're thinking, is this going to crash? But I still need a home. Am I, st <laughs> am I standing on the edge of a cliff, right? About to be kicked over it. Uh, yeah. I mean, during the financial crisis, it was a severe case of FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. And um, there's certainly a component to that now. But lenders, as a general rule, aren't cooperating in the same way. You know, the one exception is we're seeing like um, I did a presentation. Um, I'm part of RAC, which is uh, I was a president a few years ago, a real estate a, a, a relocation appraisals and consultants. And we had a conference in Dallas and I was talking I did a presentation with an agent in Dallas. And at one point, 85 percent of the transactions sort of in the spring and winter of 2021 had the appraisal waived, which is shocking. Um, it was a negotiation tool and um, and is sort of counter to the logic of banks being more conservative. Um, but it became like this marketing tool. Now it, that's dropped quite a bit. And even last fall, uh, fall of, I mean, a year ago fall, uh, I saw numbers that said something to the idea that 70% of appraisals that were done for the GSEs, or I think it was just Fannie Mae was the, were the numbers for Fannie Mae, 70% did not have an appraisal. Wow. And so you look at, you know, how we say this time it's different, but sometimes it, there's elements that sort of ring familiar you know, and you and you wonder, although I think part of that was sort of prompted by this idea that um, appraisers didn't want to go in houses mm. during the, you know, the at least the early days of the lockdown. And so, hey, let's let's do a workaround temporarily. Um, so it's interesting. It It is. And that that might burn them, but we, we just don't know what will happen. Yeah, we, we just don't know. And I kind of doubt it only because credit quality of the GSC portfolios, you know, those, the mortgages they have in portfolio are like the highest in history, the highest credit quality in history. So it doesn't seem to be taking them down the same path. So anyway, they've, they've learned their lessons, hopefully. Well, to yeah, I think that's giving them too much credit, but, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, perhaps to a certain component of that. Yes, I agree. Hopefully so. Yeah, hopefully. Fingers crossed. When it comes to a bubble forming, so it doesn't look like we're in a bubble right now, but yeah. if one was to begin to form, what kinds of things might be an indicator that that's starting to happen? Yeah, I mean, um, so you would think logically that everything we're seeing now would be a bubble, right? So you're seeing high market share bidding wars um, and you're seeing incredible run-ups in prices, you know, and, you know, we're seeing, you know, 10, 15%, 20% in different markets on a year over year basis. Um, you know, all those would say, Hey, right. Rapid growth. That's, that's a bubble. Um, I think of a bubble. Well, so I'll tell you, um, uh, what, uh, just as a quick aside, I remember in 2009, after the sort of Lehman moment, we, we, we don't call it the great financial crisis in New York, or we call it the Lehman moment, right? Oh. Lehman was sort of the moment that sort of dragged everybody down with it. Yes. And, um, and so over the next year, right, it was, you could hear a pin drop, um, contracts are down 75, 80%, like it was pretty bleak. And I remember in early 2009, I wanted to get a new suit and I saw an ad, you know, in the newspaper of this place I always go. And it was like, suits are 50% off. And I'm like, great, I'll buy it. A more expensive suit than I normally get and um, still get a deal. And uh, so I go into uh, this store and, and I, uh, and I took a suit off the rack. It was like $800 marked down to 400, which is still pricey, but you know, I was feeling good. <laughs> and uh, I went to the register and they rang it up and it was $37. And I go, 
wait, it's 400. He goes, yeah, but it's a Sunday. So we're knocking 20% off. And then it's, uh, you know, it's 50% off because we're having this special. And then you came for the ad in the paper. So that's another 20%. And then any, and he went through and it was $37. And I, wow. And I turned around and looked in the store and I was the only one in the store. And I had a chill go down my spine. I said, Oh my God, that's a recession. And I went back and bought a grab like seven more. And, Absolutely. You know, and, uh, and it was unbelievable, right? And and that's where, you know, that's where like it really like physically hit me. The rest before of it, you know, we tend to be as an appraisal firm. And I think because we're not heavily dependent on bank work, we do a lot of private work like I know you do. Yeah. And um, and so we tend to be contrarian, you know, when people are smarter than us, like during a boom, they know everything and you know, what does the appraiser know? We tend not to do as well. We tend to do really well when things are bleak or weak or uncertain. Um, you know, we sort of, I'm not saying we're hand holding, but we're, you know, when there's uncertainty, we, there's more consulting. I mean, at least that's how I find it in New York, in my market. Same here. And, um, and you know, we had a pretty, you know, after sort of feeling like the out of the, you know, I was never invited to the party during the bubble. And everybody, all the mortgage brokers, brokers, everybody's doing great. And we're like, you know, what's going on? Because we weren't morally flexible um, to make the numbers um, and all that. That, you know, you know, after the bubble, after that sort of Lehman moment in 2009, 2009 we just boomed. Um, it was incredible. I did really answer your question. Like, how do you, so, so, you know, how do we see a bubble? How do you see a bubble? And I think it's when you can't rationalize anybody's behavior. So I can sit here and rationalize why prices are up 20%. It's because we don't give enough credit, no pun intended. We don't give enough credit to the plunge in mortgage rates. So I can really don't appreciate the, the change in buying power that that has uh, caused and how much less leverage the average consumer has taken on. And so when I look at that and I look at like all this billions in stimulus coming through the economy um, and underwriting standards are tighter than normal, um, you know, I think you can look at it rationally and say, well, that kind of makes sense. It's weird, no doubt about that, but it kind of makes sense. And that's why I don't, you know, from the beginning, I, I haven't seen this as a bubble. But, you know, also I feel, you know, during this period that I am uncomfortably optimistic. Like I feel as an appraiser and a market analyst, I'm kind of paid to worry. And, and I'm, I feel much better about the future than I did after uh, Lehman, you know, like, you know, in early 2009, because the boom was facilitated by, you know, um, no underwriting that you just had to have a pulse or fog and mirror to get a mortgage. And it was all about volume in this go around lending is tighter than historically normal. And I don't mean tighter than the bubble. I mean, tighter than the period for 30 years prior to the bubble is the way that like, underwriting has not normalized. Um, certainly some lenders are better at sort of jamming things through, but it's nowhere near on the scale that it was. And I think that's, um, you know, that's kind of the situation we're in and, and a lot, you know, I think rates are going to be determined, the, the trending of rates are going to be determined by how long the Delta variant and other variants are in the picture. Um, you know, there's talk about, you know, the Fed, you know, raising rates in 2022, 2023. I mean, my crystal ball is held together with duct tape, <laughs> but, but I, you know, I, I would, it'd be hard to believe in a world where, central banks are all at one or less that that we're going to have any real um, rate growth. And the rate growth is the issue, because if we have rates, you know, the about 50 percent of everyone in the U.S. that has a mortgage has a rate of four percent or less. So four percent to me is sort of this sort of tipping point where if we have rates spike over 4%, I think you're going to see a tremendous drop in 
sales activity, you'll see inventory come up again and you'll see prices moderate. And um, there's a saying that I've used a lot in the last few months that I've heard from a couple of, couple of people, a um, couple of friends of mine that have meant, you know, sort of brought this up from the past is the best cure for high housing prices is high housing prices. <laughs> and, you know, because eventually you run out of people that can pay that. Yeah. And then the market sort of laws of su supply and demand sort of kick in and, you know, assuming all the external stuff like rates stay the same. So anyway, it's an interesting time. It definitely is. You know, if people's income isn't rising as quickly as everything else is rising, there's there's going to be a point where it stalls out right. a little bit. It's gonna yeah, yeah. When, you know, up until recently, you know, you know, income adjusted for inflation is like the negative over the last decade. And, um, you know, there's been a real short term uptick. And part of that is, you know, some people say it's because of all the unemployment um, benefits coming out of like the, you know, the, the sort of stimulus packages that have been coming out of Washington. Although I, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. Like think about right now, you know, when you're appraising something in the suburbs, like, you know, versus the city. So, you know, I'm thinking of New York versus the outlying suburbs and you're looking at it and going, you know, remote work, right? The stereotype for remote work is live in the suburbs, work in the city. But I got to tell you, in the in the city, there are neighborhoods, I'm sure, that are going to have more remote workers in the city than they will, than, than comparable counties in the suburbs. Like, it's not an urban to suburban thing. It's a sort of work benefits thing. And people have had a year and a half to test it out. And kind of worked. I mean, it's not foolproof. Like, you know, in bringing on new appraisers, you can't, you can see like, you can't mentor or train somebody fully in a professional service over Zoom. Like they've got to be immersed in it and overhear office conversation and problem solving in any profession that requires that sort of thing. It's not just taking classes. Um, and, uh, and so there's going to be, it's going to be hybrid. Like, the way I think of it is when you have, if you think about it, if you have, um, you know, before the pandemic, you have uh, 5%, 5 to 7% is the range that I've read. Let's just call it five as an even number. 5% of the workforce is 100% remote work or close to it. And say that's going to double or triple. So that's 10 or 15%. Like that's a no brainer. You can do the math on that. It's easy. It's the next 50% of the workforce that's going to be working, you know, instead of five days a week, four, three, two, or one. And that's what's being determined right now. Like, and it's not going to be with the Delta variant, like it was sort of like we're sort of thinking September, October, you know, this is all going to be resolved. And we're not going to go back to where we were, but we're not going to be where we just came from, which I called peak Zoom, right? Where everybody's <laughs> working at home or not everybody, but many people. Yes. You know, but we're going through this period um, of discovery, so to speak. And I think that's going to be a couple of years. Um, some industries are going to do more remote work than other. And it, you know, for many things, it just works. Conferences, I don't think you're going to have, you know, as many business conferences as you did, you might, you'll still have, you know, instead of having four a year for, you know, one industry, they might have one in person and three remote, right? You still want to press the flush, but it's expensive and time consuming and inefficient. And we've just been kind of used to it. I, I think things are really going to be shaken up and I kind of excited about it. Like, I, I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. And I completely agree. I, I've loved the Zoom aspect of things. I've been to more meetings probably in the last year and a half than in the past five years before that. It's just it's so yeah, easy. And, you, and, you, and, you, and therefore, you get more information, more insights. It's more efficient. It's less costly. I mean, all those things. It, it makes sense. L listen, like, I don't think anybody just loves 100% Zoom life. No. Um, you know, we are, you know, social creatures. Uh but I think we were sort of, you know, I think this opened our eyes that 
we were probably too far at one end of the spectrum and we need a little you know a little bit of both instead of you know all in in person and the world's going to change as a result of it you know it's fascinating is when you think about valuation in the suburbs um and you think about remote work um you know i think the the biggest changes to look for in sort of the direction or trends in valuation are going to be you know i look at the pandemic and i'm being optimistic but i'm looking at it as a temporary that it's either going to be eradicated or brought under control yeah. at some point in the next couple of years um at least at the very minimum brought under control of some kind like look at how far we've advanced just in the last year we didn't even have a vaccine in the sum, you know, summer of 2020, it was last, it's been a year, right? And and then vaccine is like on everybody's mind, you know, so who knows a year from now with additional research and all that. So you look at that and say, okay, so that's brought under control. What is going to remain the residual of the pandemic is remote work. It's, you know, the proxy, I, you know, I call it, you know, to Zoom um, as a proxy for remote working. It's, it's embedded and it's gonna change a lot of things. One of the things we've seen in New York so far is, um, you know, I'm always trying to get into the Urban Dictionary <laughs> and uh, and uh, I try to, I usually come up with a phrase once a year and my late, uh, my, one of my uh, phrases last year was co-primary and it's this idea that second home vacation markets end up becoming second primary or co-primary markets because you know maybe those people that don't need to be in the in the office have more flexibility maybe they live three hours from work but only commute once a week once a week or once every two weeks you know i mean i'm sure people wouldn't mind commuting two or three hours one day a week and then work at home four days a week like that'd be um easy. and yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a no brainer and you could still probably, you know, do phone calls in the car and all that stuff as you're driving. So like, it doesn't seem, it seems plausible to me. Um, and so, uh, you know, how is that going to impact different markets, second home markets, the suburbs? We just don't know. Like it, there's so much hap, you know, it, it's all up in the air and that's what makes it exciting. I think for evaluation anyway. I agree. It is very exciting. It, it's so cool to watch history unfold basically right before our eyes, a major. Yeah. In real time and quickly. I mean, that's the thing, like, you know, uh, it's not like, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, a, a snail's pace. I mean, it's, it's very quickly. And, and so you have to be careful not to be sort of stuck in a mindset about like your first experiences with valuation early in the pandemic are probably irrelevant now, right? I mean, the, you know, it's 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 just an ongoing learning process. Definitely. Even my narratives have changed from, you know, the time that the pandemic started. I, I'm not even mentioning the pandemic now, you know, just what's right, going exactly. on right now. Right, exactly. It's it's uh actually, you know, I've I've I'm phasing it out too. And really like I have this and I I I started my blog in 2005 and it sort of morphed morphed into my my matrix blog and it's sort of I used to blog three four five times a day when I first started and then it sort of morphed into housing notes six years ago or so almost six years ago and um, and one of the things that um, you know when I, when I think about I don't know I, I, I don't know when you think about like something that you wrote about the market five years ago or six years ago or 10 years ago, and you kind of laugh, you're like, what, like, what was that? Like, I have no idea what that was. Um, now it's like, well, that was nine months ago. Like that's prehistoric. Uh, <laughs> you know, like the frame of reference uh, is so different. Um, so interesting. So. It is. I don't know about you, but I've I've actually had to take a lot longer on my appraisal work um, just to analyze the market on every report. Not that I wasn't analyzing it before, but now you, you there's so it's much to think as, about. The, and also, too, I find that the messaging like from the data is not as consistent or as obvious as it used to be. 
Absolutely. Uh, which is sort of a, you know, which makes it harder, but, um, but makes our services more valuable is the way I look at it. Definitely. Most definitely. One last question I had for you, just speaking about rates, this, this is something that's kind of interesting. We, you know, we've watched mortgage rates drop for decades and decades and then, you know, they fluctuate a little bit, but I mean, we're near it's cheap, cheap money, almost free money. When you think about yeah. it. Yeah. Have, do you think that we've painted ourselves into a corner? Cause usually when there's a problem in, in housing, they lower the interest rates and that creates demand, but we're almost to a point where there's no more room to do that. Just think, right. Right. We're cool. actually in a, uh, yeah. Uh, although, uh, if you like, I've heard this coming out of sort of prognosticators, for the last decade, right? Low rates can't get any lower, right? And it's <laughs> like, and then they get lower, right? Yes. And then rates can't get any lower, and then they get lower, and then there's a taper tantrum, and then and then it's wrong, and then they get lower and they get lower. And then we have a pandemic, it's lower, right? But um, at some point, you're right. Like, so I think we're definitely um, you know, the Fed has less wiggle room. Um, and you know, one of the things this is like, I would love it for rates to be at four or 5%, which seems more normal to me. Yeah. Um, you know, we, but with that comes a massive drop in value. Um, it just in our lifetime, my sense is that we're sort of stuck at this level, you know, plus or minus, you know, half a percent or a percent. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, some people think, you know, in a couple of years, rates will really rise. I, I feel for that to happen, the whole world has to see the same thing. Um, and right now the whole world is stuck like we are for the most part. Um, so I guess the answer is, yeah, it's harder for us to manage, like to, to prime the pump, so to speak. Um, and that's not a good thing. And also I think, you know, I think rates this low suck. Pardon my French, because <laughs> all it does, people, you know, it's like, hey, it makes it more affordable. No, it doesn't. It does in the immediate short term. Like you're, you know, you're, you're getting, you're buying a house, and the and then the rate falls like that day, you know, noticeably, and your price isn't renegotiated, right? You know, it's like, come on, sellers see the rates falling just like buyers do, and they say, hey, they can, you know, it's all about the the share of the payment that goes to principal and interest and lower rates cause asset values to rise. I mean, that's what it is. And that's exactly what just happened. You know, if you think about it, like existing home sale numbers, you know, up, you know, depending on the regions or whatever, like 10, 15% year over year, people's wages didn't go up 10 or 15%. No, you know, they went up, but you know, nom modestly, nominally, maybe, um, it's just, it's rate driven, right? And so how many more times can we go back to the, the trough? I, you know, I think we're getting limited, but I, I don't want to say we're at the end because that's what was said a couple <laughs> of years ago. I've never, so I'm, I've never been uh, disappointed by, you know, what happened. So um, anyway, it's going to be, it's going to be really, really interesting. And uh, at least, right now or for the next year or so um let's enjoy it <laughs> let's absolutely enjoy the volume. most definitely we're gonna soak up this market and and yeah uh, it's exciting to see what the future is gonna hold so yeah absolutely uh, well i sure appreciate you uh, being so generous with your time and sitting down to visit about the housing market and bubbles not bubbles uh, your your insights are valuable to to me and to to many people around the country so if, if well, someone would think Oh, I was going to say thank you, Jamie. I, you know, and I just, you know, just to be clear, like today is my birthday, and I, as I told you earlier, I, my wife asked me what I wanted for my birthday, and I said I just want to be on Jamie's podcast. So, oh man! So uh, there we go. You hit me um, right in the heart. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I am I am so honored. I have to tell you, <laughs> I look forward to when we get together and break some bread in person. Oh, absolutely! Can't come too soon for sure. And if someone would like to read your housing notes, how can they find you? 
Uh, the best way is to go to my website, which is uh, millersamuel.com. And on the homepage, you can sign up. They come out every Friday at 2 p.m. I have a pretty wide audience, not just appraisers. It's not just appraisal, it's real estate, you know, and it's sort of perishable stuff. It's stuff that happened over the week, the big issues, and, um, uh, you know, anything to do with housing for the most part, which you might find helpful. And, uh, and it's a labor of love. So uh, Fridays at 2 p.m. is when they come out. I look forward to Friday at 2 p.m. every week. I, I've been reading your notes for years and I, I really, I love them. There, there's a Appreciate lot we can it. learn, so. Well, we'll look forward to talking again in person soon. Thank you, Jamie, anytime. I agree with Jonathan. It does not appear that we're in a housing bubble currently. When people ask me if I think we're in a bubble, I think what they're really asking is, do you expect the housing market to implode anytime soon? While it doesn't look like it, I think it's good to point out that none of us knows what the future will hold. There are so many variables that can change what happens to the housing market. However, based upon the fundamentals that appraisers and other real estate professionals analyze, it does not appear that we're headed for a 2008 crash again in housing. There are some things to look out for in the future, though. Changes in interest rates, changes in supply and demand, and affordability. Clearly, things are not going to continue to increase at the rates that they have been over the past year and a half. But that doesn't mean that the housing market's going to implode anytime soon. As appraisers, we do not speculate about what's going to happen to the housing market after the appraisal is completed. We just don't know. We can only report what's taking place as of the effective date of that report. We don't have a bubble meter. We don't make bubble adjustments. We reflect what's taking place in the market, whether it's a bubble or not. And certainly if we see data in our analysis that would indicate a possible change in the future, then by all means, we'll include that information in our report as well. Well, I hope that you enjoyed our bubblicious conversation today. No matter what happens in the future, I hope that all your encounters with bubbles are happy ones. And a special thank you to my friend, Jonathan Miller for taking time out to share his expertise and experiences with us. And now I leave you with the delightful music of my podcast outro. From all my real estate appraisal family, good wishes, good health, and good night. And a one and a two.